There's too many problems in Oregon that have been avoided, ignored, and made worse by Governor Brown. And, and people in Oregon are hungry for change. I wake up every single morning and I put on my metal underpants. I have to. I have to. You cannot take this personally. Now at 6, we're taking a closer look at the race for Oregon's next governor, how the candidates are tackling the issues, and those attack ads. They blame local law enforcement. They need to do their job and work with us to ensure the public safety. So we have federal and local law enforcement going head to head here, blaming each other for the release of an undocumented immigrant who deputies say went on to murder his wife. How a technical hiccup may have played a role in this man going free. There's no resources at all. Anything happens out there, there's nothing anybody can do about it. And homeless crisis on the coast. The new plan Astoria leaders have to deal with homeless campers. So it has been the most expensive governor's race in Oregon's history. Some also say it may be the nastiest. Radio, television, online, attack ads, attack ads everywhere. Many people describing this race as too close to call. Call it whatever you want, though. In four days, it's going to be over. Governor Kate Brown and Representative Newt Bueller will spend this weekend meeting with tens of thousands of voters all across the state, but not before sitting down with our Chris Willis. He joins us now and Chris, this one may go down to the wire. Laurel Dan, this one, of course, a lot closer than a lot of people had originally predicted. Right now, Governor Brown has a three point lead margin of error plus or minus 3.7 percentage points. All said and done, close to $25 million will have been spent on this race. And as the clock is ticking, both candidates are sticking to their messages. I think it's critically important in this time in our nation's history that we keep Oregon moving forward. Frustration I hear over and over again is about a state government that is underperforming. Governor Kate Brown and Representative Newt Bueller came back to KGW this week for what is likely their last sit-down interview before the election. The issues of education and homelessness remain at the forefront. Since I've become governor, we've invested $300 million and we have 14,000 units built or in the pipeline, which is extraordinary. The two issues that come back over and over, Chris, uh, no matter if I'm in urban Oregon or, or rural Oregon, is our underperforming K through 12 schools. Uh, you've brought a lot of attention to it over the years and also our homelessness crisis. When it comes to education, it's no secret. Kids in Oregon don't go to school as many days as kids across the country. And our graduation rates are abysmal, with one out of every four students not graduating. And it's been that way for a while. There's too many problems in Oregon that have been avoided, ignored, and made worse by Governor Brown. And, and people in Oregon are hungry for change. Bueller says he'll take graduation rates from the bottom five to the top five in five years by improving education standards, teacher support, career and technical priorities, and a longer school year. Governor Brown says her education plan is working, and she's committed to keeping it going. She told me she'll also work to lengthen the school year to 180 days. Make sure every single high school student has access to career and technical ed, hands-on learning. That means fully funding uh, ballot measure 98. As for homelessness, Bueller has released a plan he calls Compassion and tough love to end homelessness by 2023 with 8,000 new beds. He says he'll name a chief homeless solutions officer on his first day in office. And I realize that's ambitious, but I also know that it's achievable. And a, a part of that is Wapato. It's a facility that can has a thousand beds, sits on 20 acres. Governor Brown says her homeless package will focus on housing with proximity to social services. My package is a $370 million package. We have to get our children and families off the street. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask them both about those negative campaign ads flooding your airwaves, attacking each other from every conceivable angle. What's it like to watch those ads? Their answers, again, showing a stark contrast between these two candidates. I just think how unfortunate it is. Unfortunate for Governor Brown, who's been in a leadership position for decades in Salem, uh, in her lack of accomplishment for those decades that she is now uh, resorting to just negative personal attack ads. I don't want to say hurt feelings, but is it frustrating? Is it, well, you know what I mean? I mean I, just as a person, I, it's got to be. Chris, I, I, this is not my first rodeo, yeah. right? Okay. Um, <laughs> I wake up every single morning and I put on my metal underpants. I have to. I have to. You cannot take this personally. 
All right, get this. Governor Brown's campaign has knocked on more than 100,000 doors just in the past few days. Newt Bueller is on his One Oregon tour, campaigning this weekend in several Oregon cities. Both candidates are sincerely optimistic about their chances, and this one will likely come down to voter turnout. Get this. The governor reminded me that the first time she ran for public office, she won by a mere seven votes. Laurel? Boy, that metal underpants <laughs> quote is one to yeah. go down in, the, <laughs> in history for yeah, us. I think she might have made up her own <laughs> phrase there. I like it. I'm going to steal it. Thank you, Chris. It's touted as a nonpartisan tool to assist you in voting, but how exactly does the Oregon voters pamphlet get put together, and is it fact-checked for accuracy? Who else to ask but our KGW's Kristen Severn. She's here to verify this massive booklet that we all get in the mail every election cycle. Yeah, it's certainly not light reading, right? 151 pages. This book is sent to every person in Oregon weeks before Election Day. But can you trust the statements inside this guide and who even decides what statements are included? A KGW News viewer first contacted us after she flipped through her pamphlet. She wanted to know why four out of five arguments for Measure 105, the measure that would repeal Oregon status as a sanctuary state, were furnished by one person, Cynthia Kendall. Kendall and her group Stop Oregon Sanctuaries submitted five arguments in total for their ballot measure, while opposing groups submitted 41. Stop Oregon Sanctuaries and any other group wishing to make a statement on a measure was required to submit 500 signatures or pay $1,200 per statement. Kendall and Stop Oregon Sanctuaries paid for all five with some help from the authors. We just wanted to make sure that our message in the voters pamphlet covered the issues that we thought were the most important about the measure. Meanwhile, there were several dozen arguments filed against Measure 105. Andrea Williams, with no on 105, says many organizations donated to the campaign so they could get a statement in there. And other groups, they actually collected signatures from U.S. citizens in order to be placed in the voter pamphlet. That gets to every single household in the state. So it's not just registered voters, it's every single household, 1.8 million households. Elections Director Stephen Trout told us anyone can submit an argument in the voters pamphlet and they can say anything they want. We don't review them for the content or for the truthfulness or, uh, or any of those things. Okay, so we can verify anyone can get into the voters pamphlet and say pretty much anything they want as long as they pay or get signatures. The statements are not fact checked for accuracy. Laurel. Mm. Thank you, Kristen. Good to hear about that. We're taking a look at the individual measures and initiatives on our local ballots. And today we're talking about measure 26199. That's the Metro bond to pay for affordable housing and its companion measure 102. I talked a little earlier today with our KGW political analyst Len Bergstein about it. Len, thanks for being here. This time we're talking about measure 26199 and that's the Metro bond to pay for affordable housing. What are people going to be voting on on this one? There's broad agreement, Laurel, as you know, in the, that there's an affordable housing crisis in our region. So Metro, our regional government, said, look, I'm going to go around to the, all of the local partners and put something on the ballot that is a bond that will create a pool of money, about $650 million, to be using for affordable units. Uh, that way we can take a crack at this problem and decide whether or not more money and building of units is the right way to solve this problem. There are some people on the no side who say, no, you ought to take that money or take some money and give people vouchers and just let them buy their own. But the people who are the yes side want to tell voters, look, the market won't solve this problem. We've got to have bond money in order to build our way out of the problem. And this would raise property taxes. It would pay for 2,400 affordable units, but it would pay for more, about 1,500 additional ones if this companion measure, 102, which would change the state constitution passes. What's that all about? Well, it's nice that voters have got these two together on the same ballot. 102 would change our Constitution. There was a prohibition or forbidding the monies from the state to be used with private builders. It was a kind of a reform issue back uh, a while back. And they didn't want to take bond money and say, oh, we're going to give it to private sector builders. So there's a, been a limitation on the kinds of uh, numbers of units that can be can be built. So this will change that. It will remove, if the if 102 passes, voters will be saying, no, let's take the money and get it out into the private sector. Let's go to nonprofits and private developers and let's build our way out of the problem that way. 
some folks may be wondering, hey, Metro is not in the business of, of housing or of mm -hmm. building or paying for housing. What are they doing to prepare for this? Well, luckily, they, pre they saw that argument that you kind of like raised uh, right away. And they said, look, we're not trying to open another, another part of our government or add to government. We're going to take the money. We're going to be kind of a pass-through unit. We're going to use our regional-wide boundaries to collect enough money to take a whack at this problem. And then we're going to hand the money back to those housing authorities in the counties in a proportion to the, to the size of the problem in each county. And those places will be the pl where the money will be handed out. So Metro is serving an aggregator in, uh, to bring the money together and also then to distribute it back to people who've got real skill in doing this. Well, we'll see you again on Monday. We're going to talk about the measures that deal with Oregon values, Measure 105, which regards the sanctuary law, and Measure 106, which would restrict uh, access to abortion. That's coming up on Monday. You can find complete election coverage in our guide on KGW.com. Thanks again, Len. Thank you. Another great explainer from Laurel and Len. Appreciate it. Federal investigators, uh, immigration officials, are sparring now with Multnomah County Sheriff's Office officials over a man accused of murdering his wife and dumping her body near Sandy. So we've learned today that 45-year-old Martin Gallo Gallardo is an illegal immigrant. Now ICE is saying that he should have been in their custody. KGW's Pat Doris live in Southeast Portland where he talked with the sheriff. Pat, what do you have to say? Right, Dan. Well, the sheriff here runs the jail, and he is furious at the way the immigration officials are pointing the finger of blame at him and them. Basically, the agency is saying that the jail did not cooperate with immigration agents, and because of that, the defendant was not behind bars, but was free and able to murder his wife. The ongoing battle between the federal immigration agency ICE and the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office took off again today. I am deeply disappointed that ICE is putting our community at risk with their failed enforcement strategy of not using the authority the agency already has to hold people accountable. Sheriff Mike Reese pointing the finger of blame at ICE for not bringing criminal charges against Gallo Gallardo before he bailed out of jail. But the agency said it's the sheriff's office that is the problem, stating in a release, it's unfortunate that law enforcement agencies like the Multnomah County Jail refuse to work with ICE to promote public safety by holding criminals accountable and providing justice and closure for their victims. At issue, the release of Martin Gallo Gallardo back in March after he'd been arrested for domestic violence. ICE sent us this detainer request, which they say they sent the jail. It states that Gallo Gallardo is from Mexico and asked to be notified 48 hours before his release. The clear message is if he'd been picked up by immigration as he got out of the county jail, he would have not been free to kill his wife. The sheriff's office says it never got that fax. And that fax was never, never arrived at the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. It's 2018. Let's start using good technology. The sheriff also said it could not have complied with the request and that ICE knows it. This is not the first time the two have butted heads over this issue. In the summer of 2017, Sergio Martinez Mendoza brutally beat and raped two strangers in Portland. He was in the country illegally. ICE pointed out that he'd been arrested and jailed in Multnomah County on other crimes, but then set free without ICE being notified. ICE also said that there is no way for a judge to issue a criminal warrant for an administrative ICE hold. Back to you. Thank you, Pat. A security guard in Portland is accused of a racially biased crime. Police say he confronted a Muslim family and attacked people with a baton and pepper spray. He made his first appearance in court today, and our Brian Brennan joins us live. Brian, his appearance was short, but court documents reveal more details about this. That's right. His appearance was brief. It was via a video conference, mostly just talking to his lawyer, and his lawyer entered in a not guilty plea. Police say 37-year-old Nathan Skates confronted a Muslim family and ended up hitting a Hispanic woman in the hand with a baton on the waterfront in August. Court documents show he works as a security guard at a nearby hotel and used racial slurs. Witnesses say he called members of the group terrorists and said to go back to your country. Police Police say he sprayed two people with pepper spray trying to get away. He was arrested yesterday and charged with assault in the second degree. Advocates against hate crime say this crime is part of a disturbing trend, and they say half of all hate crimes go unreported. We are definitely seeing an increase in, in hate crimes uh, and in hate viol violence generally uh, in Portland, and it's been reported across the country as well. 
Shubiner cites two reports showing hate crimes have increased by 12% in the 10 largest U.S. cities and one report showing there has been a significant increase in Portland since 2017. Skates is scheduled to appear back in court on the 13th at 9 a.m. Back to you. All right, Brian, we know you stay on top of it for us. Appreciate that. Meanwhile, coming up, homeless camps in Astoria re uh, receiving notice. What city leaders are doing that has campers saying there's no place left to go. And a nice sunset just finishing up out of the Reserve Golf Course in Washington County. And we had our beautiful starts of the day, too, with this rainbow from the Dows. Over the weekend, we have a real mix, a little fog, a little rain, and some sun. We'll time it all out and have the football forecast, too.